Okay, we're recording, so uh, this is just like a stream uh, that I'm doing with uh, Errol, and hopefully Travis will be joining us. Uh, the reason uh, is for the following, and I'll just hopefully you can share my screen. Um, as you can see here, my YouTube channel uh, surpassed the 500 subscriber mark, so huzzah. So I decided to do something special today. So uh, what we will be doing is we will be discussing a blog post I wrote a couple of years ago. Um, can you see that, Earl? I can. Okay, good. Uh, it is how to be an effective uh, apologist. Um, so any like missionaries or like any people who are potentially uh, interested in becoming or being involved in apologetics, you know, in some way or another. Hopefully, this will be like a good discussion, and it won't simply be like a copy and paste uh, discussion about um from this, but like uh, we'll have some interactions with Errol as well on this, as well as Travis uh, if and when he'll join us. Um, you know, the infamous Ryan, if you're a certain uh, reformed uh, douchebag from Utah. I'm not going to name names, but we all know who we're talking about here. <clears throat> James Hazelton. So, um, so. And Errol, of course, is like the super genius when it comes to all things patristic, so, um, I think you're muted, but, uh, yeah, um, yeah, so, so, like, um, you know, uh, we've all been involved in apologetics in some way, shape, or form, so, like, uh, Errol, how about you kind of, uh, briefly, uh, discuss, um, your interactions with, say, apologetics and all that fun stuff, you know, what got you interested in it on, like, a LDS level, and, you know, how do you do apologetics yourself, you know? Well, it was largely an extension of the apologetics I was already involved in ever since my youth, um, since I was raised a Lutheran. Uh, one of my earliest friends was the atheist, so we had a lot of interesting conversations and plenty of opportunity to, you know, defend the Christian faith in general. So it's always been an interest of mine, because um, I'm also always prone to playing the devil's advocate and kind of picking up my own positions and preconceptions and questioning and reassessing um which is uh nice to do in advance because you get surprised less that way from uh, from other people though there are some pretty far out ideas when it comes to latter-day saints um based largely upon uh misunderstandings incomplete information um so we get some rather wild uh claims on occasion to defend against, um, which is, yeah, uh, I think the weirdest one might have been um, Mormons worship babies on the other side of the moon. I think that might be the strangest one. That's <laughs> not that you've not heard that one. That's just back crap crazy. So yeah, yeah, it is, it, and that, that's the kind of thing that happens. I mean, the degree of misinformation is so profound that you will occasionally find things like that um typically a lot of apologetics depending on who you're debating and the venue in which you're debating uh is mostly just correcting misinformation and the person that you're uh, engaging with will either be receptive to that or they won't because if you take someone's favorite arguments away from them and leave them without uh, a platform to kind of uh, attack you from if that's their mentality then usually they just get really really defensive and try to double down on these things regardless of it's like hey look at all of this you know information to the contrary from primary source material um it, it's kind of hit and miss because you never know when you're going to get like a quality critic of the church um or someone who's just they fancy that they really have a good grasp on what Latter-day Saints believe, like a more nuanced view, when in actuality they kind of just have this idea of a caricature of Latter-day Saint beliefs, and straw man arguments abound. Um, the first thing I usually have to do is uh, parse it out into, it, am I dealing with an individual and having a private conversation, or am I in a public venue, and are there onlookers, which can really affect uh the way that a dialogue tends to go. But my general approach to that is also an extension um, from my general uh, interaction as a Christian. Um, ever since I discovered the early Christian writings, they just became more and more, you know, predominant part of uh, 
the way that I assess uh, my own beliefs uh, and other faith traditions and their creeds. And, yeah, and we'll definitely discuss like say the role and importance of patristics and sources as well. Um, you know, I do have actually have that marked off at the end, so we'll definitely get to okay. that. So um yeah, I'll just share my screen again. Like um, you know, some tips on becoming an effective LDS apologist. Um I'll just read it and then we can actually discuss it. Um and this is from a few years ago. Uh, all Latter day Saints are called the apologists in some limited way that is to defend the gospel if when the occasion calls for it, you know, you see you know, the text uh, 1 Peter 3, 15 to 16, where you have to give an answer in apologia, you know, for the hope that's in you. Section 71 of the Doctrine and Covenants, where Sidney Rigdon and Joseph Smith are set, instructed to, like, debate people openly, and, you know, uh, God will use their answers to, like, um, quell any uh, objections and so forth, you know. Um, you know, we also know, have, know like, St. John Taylor, B.H. Roberts, and others in the early days of the church, um, you know, would have public debate and stuff like that, and that continues in some limited format today as well. Uh, of course, there's no calling or office of LDS apologist, you know, um, and some are not equipped to do apologetics on a regular basis, as some of us do, and that is fine. However, for those who wish to enter the realm of LDS apologetics, here are some tips in no particular order and in no attempt to be exhaustive for those who wish to become an effective Latter day Saint apologist. So, um, just on that, um, you know, everyone is to be, everyone in the, uh, everyone who's baptized in the church is expected to be an apologist in the sense that, like, if and when you come across something, uh, antagonistic, you're to stand up and defend the church. Now, that doesn't mean, like, you make an ass of yourself or, like, you kind of, um, you know, you kind of hear, um, you know, about, like, a anti LDS lecture, you know, in the uh, Baptist hall down the road, and you kind of just, like, uh, think you know it all and you'll refute them or something like that. But even when the occasion does come up, though, you are to defend the church. You know, we're meant to, like, be informed at the very least when it comes to, say, the basics of the church very well. You know, um, you don't have to know Ugaritic or Hebrew, you know, or the patristics, like, the back of your hand, you know, but at the same time, you are to know what you believe, and that often is, like, half the battle, because a lot of the criticisms come from, like, say, fundamentalist Protestants and others, where they think the Godmaker is, like, a documentary. <laughs> so, um, at least in my experience, like, say, 90% um, or, like, a large portion of the stuff you'll, uh, if you know how to answer a fundamentalist, you know, like, a, a hardcore fan of Ed Decker or something like that, you know, someone who thinks, like, Mormons believe Jesus was born in Jerusalem Allah, out on the 710 or something like that. That's most of the anti-LDS material you'll come across either online or in person. You know? yeah. um, but at the same time, like, I think, like, every member of the church um, should be able to answer, like, say, the very basic criticisms, like, you know, uh, there's a French word in Jacob 727 or Alma 710 in the birthplace of Jesus or the Revolution 22 argument. I know you laugh because, you know, it's so piss poor and it's so commonplace, but at the same time, it's still more frequent than some of the better, relatively speaking, criticisms, you know, you know, so. Yeah. Any thoughts yeah. yourself on that anyway? Yeah, I mean, those are, I've lost count on, on all of those. Uh, and, and, and backtracking, so, so you can point out to people that Revelation that it's talking about the book of Revelation, the Bible is not a collected you know, set of works that Revelation is Second and third John were probably written after the book of Revelation, according to biblical scholars at large. And you, you can lay that information out. And, and then in my experience, people tend to get creative and try to think on their feet. And it's like, oh, well, that statement was given prophetically since God knew that the Bible would be a collected 66 books uh, in, in, in the future. And that's what it was referring to, which is, and then you have to explain the difference between exegesis and eisegesis to someone uh, and let them realize just how firmly what they just said uh, falls into the latter category. Anyone can just make up But that, that's when you tend to find out is the person you're discussing with actually open to information that they were not previously privy to? Or are they completely close to it? And as I said, if you're having a private conversation, that's usually when the conversation ends. Because what's the point? As apologists, you know, there is no calling in the church. Uh, there is no uh, real money uh, to be pursuing, you know, or interested in apologetics. We have to decide how we're going to spend this time. 
that we have. And, uh, I've, uh, just a few months ago, for example, uh, my wife, I would leave most of the, uh, interfaith, uh, groups on Facebook that I was a uh, part of because it, it just wasn't fruitful. And for the, for the most part, that is correct. Uh, more often than not, was we're not, I didn't, I didn't learn a whole lot. You get to a point where you, you've heard pretty much the same rehashing of these arguments over and over again, like the ones you just mentioned. And that just becomes kind of the norm. Um, apologetics becomes less exciting, I would say. Uh, as you go deeper, because it just becomes very uh, repetitive. Do you remember the title that uh, Daniel Peterson and William Hamblin were going to give to? Oh, uh, Bill and Dan's Excellent Adventure in Anti-Mormon Zombie Hell, I believe that was. <laughs> yeah, something to that effect. Um, it's like, yeah, I, I totally get it. And they were probably exposed to a lot more of that than me because they were doing the farms review of books all the time, that kind of stuff. And it's like, wow, if it gets monotonous for me, those guys, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's not always easy. In and, that and, and Travis, he's now joining us. Um, so. Hi, Travis. Can you hear us, Travis? Perhaps not yet. Oh, okay. Maybe if I start calling him Ryan. Anyway, uh, yeah, but as you were saying, um, yeah, there's a lot of repetition. Like, for every, like, say, good intellectually honest critic and like not all critics are anti-mormons you know i think like it's important maybe now to like just because someone strongly disagrees with the church or even thinks the church is false does not make them an anti-mormon um an anti-mormon is someone who like it's like a fred anson or a rob bowman you know someone who um frankly has no intellectual honesty or integrity he's just like uh I don't know, like, how would you, uh, maybe I should throw this out, like, how would you define an anti-Mormon, you know, and how would you differentiate between an anti-Mormon and a, just <clears> like, <throat> even if they're a bit of a hardcore critic? Uh, I tend to measure it by uh, how much vitriol they have. Um, mm -hmm. it, it goes back to, if, if they're not willing to take in any new, you know, information, if they're not willing to change any of their views based on, you know, external information that comes to their attention uh that level of you know closed minded is that lack of objectivity is kind of one of the earmarks that i look at when i'm thinking is this person like an anti-saint is it at which point the the only point in having any kind of exchange with them is if it's actually in a public venue and someone can actually learn something from the exchange itself otherwise it's really just a, a fruitless exchange i've had to cut short some back and forth via email upon having that realization. It's like, mm, no good, not worth my time. Yeah, and I, I think that, uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, good. Um, like, uh, so recently I was doing, uh, we were having a Facebook discussion with, uh, I don't remember what his first name is, but Constantino, I think that's what he is, the one that debated Daniel, uh, yeah, Daniel, Jake, Daniel, yeah, I thought it was Daniel, but uh, somebody like that who just makes makes a claim says that this is what this is what the scriptures say, this is what it is, um, provides no interaction with any text, but just provides a series of proof texting. Oh, well, that's then because you, he's a James White lackey. He doesn't know how to engage right, with Jesus Yeah, himself. and so if you if you engage with some form of exegetical analysis of those passages and showing that they don't actually say that you start sharing, for example, scholarship on the topic that explains those passages don't mean what they think that they do. He just says, well, you've got poor, that, that was really poor analysis on your part, but he doesn't provide any counter analysis analysis to refute what you just stated or what you've yeah, shared. Yeah, he's like Calvinist, like you're spiritually dead. Right. It's like the orthodox when it comes to you know, 
Yeah. And so, <laughs> and so, and so, just just like what Errol's saying is, anybody that's that's in that kind of a camp, but then I mean, even that I think is fine if you want to do that because I mean, some people are just so so tied up into their own dogmatic perspectives regarding religion and theology that they can't really think beyond it. That's fine. But it's then now you're directing vitriol at Latter-day Saints or you're engaging in a Latter-day Saint, you know, salvation ministry, but you also won't engage in any kind of critical thinking with respect to any arguments proposed to you by Latter-day Saints. That's an anti-Mormon. Yeah, and again, you've got your I, James Whites, your Constantinos, you know, his lackeys, of course. Yeah, and also like one example over like the last two or three years, and myself and Chris Davis has kind of done this, um, Rob Bowman and these really low IQ Temple of Solomon argument. Like it's been refuted over and over again, and he still thinks it's a valid argument. Um, I, I haven't read that one. I'm not sure that I'm familiar with his with his Temple of Solomon argument. Well, the TLDR is like, um, he claims because Nephi called the temple in the New World the Temple of Solomon as opposed to the temple. Oh, it's anachronistic, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's it's anachronistic. anachronistic. But mm-hmm. like in Amos 9, which is in pre exilic text, the booth or tabernacle is named after David, not Yahweh. And like, you have like loads of uh, scholars, like even Tom, uh, I forgot his first name, I think it's Thomas, but Thomas Thompson, um, arguing that the booth or tabernacle of David refers to the temple. Mm-hmm. Yeah. as well so it's not just like uh myself and chris but yeah that's 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 a very good example i've documented but yeah so uh maybe if we continue with the uh, uh article the first point i bring up is um have a spiritual witness of the truth of the restored gospel uh no one should enter the realm of apologetics unless they know the truthfulness of the restored gospel i've seen uh many and unfortunately i'm guessing you guys have as well into apologetics just to get the testimony of the desire it doesn't work that way unless one is built on the rock of revelation one's foundation is out of sand so um yeah. you know if you're if you're going to be engaged in apologetics and i'm not talking about like say you know uh, how to answer a fundamentalist like that you know just in your daily scripture reading although everyone should have a testimony even prior to that but um you know if you want to do like say what i do or what you guys do you know we do apologetics in different ways but we're still active wow. in apologetics mm-hmm. um it's it's not the time to get the testimony. If you don't have the testimony and you don't have that grounding in scripture and doctrine, you shouldn't be doing it. And especially when it comes to say right. this foundational level, if you don't have that testimony, you know, uh, basically you know that you know and God has told you. Um, oh. it, it could, and because that kind of um, aligns your assumptions and, you know, allows you to put things on the shelf, you know, with humility and stuff like that and give you patience and so forth. Uh, it can be very dangerous to enter apologetics. Yeah. You know, I mean, and for, any kind. yeah, for me personally, the, uh, the, I mean, I, 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 I've talked about this before. I've struggled with, with, you know, kind of an atheistic perspective for, for many years from the time I was a kid, but I, I, you have to make a decision to believe or not to believe. And I think the scriptures are pretty clear that every person needs to make that decision. And once you've made that decision, that that's when you're allowing some kind of a spiritual influence and you're going to start understanding and perceiving that spiritual influence because you've made that decision to believe. And some people, obviously from a, from a non-belief perspective, that sounds like the cart before the horse. And, you know, you're just engaging in, in some kind of a, of a, of a proof and and looking for what you want in that. So I get that, but um, like you're saying, you've got to be able to put things on a shelf because I think that too many Latter-day Saints who think that they're engaging in criticism or, and I mean that from the, from a positive perspective, like critically analyzing what they actually believe are not willing to put things on shelves. So I constantly get messages from missionaries and other members of the church who are saying, Hey, I've discovered this thing. And I think, okay, so like, okay. And, and what's funny is that they don't even realize what the ramification of this new thing that they discovered really is. It's just something that somebody presented to them. And even the person that presented it to them didn't really explain what its point was, but because they haven't really developed a testimony that, and and for me, one of the the linchpins for me was we exclusively, I don't know many others that do believe in an open canon. And the sola scriptura argument for me has always been just a, a, a non-starter, open canon. And Joseph Smith isn't just claimed by us to be a prophet. He claims to be a prophet. 
It's not a Martin Luther came up with some ideas and broke from the Catholic Church or other reformers aren't claiming to be prophetic or aren't claiming to reveal new understandings or restore what was lost. That's not their claim. They're just simply saying what exists is bad and I've got to do some kind of corrective action. Joseph Smith is claiming to be a prophet. And I, that to me is a, a fact that I always go back to. And that's what allows me to put things on that shelf. Okay. All right. Prophets. Now let's dissect what a prophet means. And you'll find that putting things on the shelf becomes much more easy. And, and also, like, it's important um, when it comes to, say, worldview as well, because, like, in order to believe in the gospel, you must have a supernatural worldview. You can't come to it through naturalism. If, like, if you're like Dan Vogel, you know, um, who uh, is like a metaphysical naturalist, like, basically, no matter what the evidence for, say, the Book of Mormon or Joseph Smith, because for him, the supernatural has 0% value. Even if something like is 0.00001% possible, he has to go with that. You know, like when it comes to the the hallucination theory for the witnesses, it's like um, it's like in Luke sixteen, like when the rich man pleads, you know, to uh, warn his brothers. You know, what is he told? You know, they have Moses and the prophets, so they don't believe them. They're not going to believe someone raised from the dead. You know, so um, you have to have that supernatural worldview, which doesn't mean, of course, like you accept any supernatural claim. Like I don't accept Muhammad as a prophet, but at the same time, you still have to have a uh, a worldview that allows for the supernatural. Um, because if you're a metaphysical naturalist, you know. You can't be like a Christian, let alone a Latter Day Saint, because Christianity, generally speaking, like when it comes to resurrection or special creation or Latter Day Saint theology, like how Joseph Smith produced the Book of Mormon, is like there has to be supernaturalism, in right? And at times, at least. See, I, I always found that that's an interesting component of it. Is that so? I don't know if if you watched John DeLynn's interview he did with Bart Ehrman. It was it was I thought it was pretty interesting. But one of the things DeLynn seemed to be trying to get to is. You know, we've proven supernatural things aren't don't exist and are false. And uh, I think a lot of people believe that with with Bart Ehrman's not not just his actual scholarship, but his more popular books, uh, which which I think are pretty good um, with those with those texts. He's not claiming the supernatural doesn't exist. He's simply saying that within this specific epistemology, I can't make a claim one way or the other. And unfortunately, too many people, because they're they're not thinking, they're not really actually paying attention to what he's actually saying, they believe that he's disproving spiritual things, or he's saying that they can't happen. He's just saying, look, historical criteria, for example, have no access to supernatural claims. And so I'm not I'm not saying that Jesus didn't walk on water. I'm not saying he wasn't resurrected. I'm just not accessing that question because historical criteria don't allow me to. But but Delin, it's like when he was interviewing Berman, he just didn't seem to understand that. And that's where that's where apologetics becomes, I think, important is to understand the differences between specific epistemological claims and where you're going with them, how they interact with one another, and when they don't interact with one another. Anything you want to add, Earl? Uh, yeah, so going back to the whole, you know, don't don't do apologetics, uh, you know, without having like an actual testimony. Because when I was investigating the church, my expectation going into it was, it's like, I expect for this to work out to have a cogent counterpoint to every argument against the church. And, you know, I'd, I'd be finding plenty of that, you know, in, in, in my studies and all of my Q&A sessions with set after set of missionaries and uh, other people I was talking to in the church. Um, but once I actually had a spiritual witness of, you know, the restoration, that changed my approach profoundly because I look back at like all the, the answers I had already received and the handful of things that like I hadn't gotten, you know, like an, an intellectual response from that was super satisfying. And it's like, yeah, that, it, it seems pretty petty to let those kind of things like hold me back uh any further so you have to also have to learn to you know use critical thinking yes but also get used to the idea of not uh having all of the answers and don't present uh your arguments as all of the answers um, i don't think the the know-it-all approach is uh plays off particularly well with uh with people that's just me though 
Yeah, that's good. Um, okay, that's going to go on to the uh, next point. Uh, number two, uh, know the scriptures. And at the end, I'm sure like we'll add know the patristics as well. But know the scriptures intimately. Uh, this is also central. Uh, one must know the scriptures. And yes, that includes the Old Testament. Sorry, people. Very well. Um, but one must make sure that they read the scriptures daily and have some plan to go through these scriptures at least once a year. As for myself, I read five pages of the Bible, five pages of the Book of Mormon, and a section two of the DNC Pearl Grey Prize each day. So I usually go through the Bible cover to cover in 255 days, uh, the Book of Mormon about 80 days, and the DNC and Pearl Grey Prize um, usually get read like cover to cover three or four times a year, which I know is like a lot for uh, some people, but you know. Uh, a good plan would be try to read each of the standard works cover to cover each year, not one after another, but like with one another. Um, and if one wants to get hardcore learning Kine, Greek, and Biblical Hebrew and investing in Bible software program, such as Logos or Bible Works, although that's no longer being sold, uh, would be a good place to start as well. So um, the TLDR is like, uh, know the scriptures very well um, and make sure you read them every day, you know, um, and have a plan to go through the standard works regularly. And yes, you know, that includes the Old Testament people. Uh, if, you, if you don't understand the Old Testament, you're not going to make heads or tails of the New Testament or the Book of Mormon or other things as well. So, you know, you have to know the entirety of the scriptures uh, very well. Uh, so, right. any, I'll throw it over to you guys if you want to make any comments or like nuance, you want to uh, make other suggestions or whatever. Especially like when, especially when it comes to say apologetics, you know, um, how you knowing the scriptures is like NB uh, for apologetic. Yes. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a necessary preparatory step to any kind of apologetic. Um, I don't have quite as you know structured um, reading plan for the scriptures. Uh, reading scriptures just comes naturally out of reading early Christian writings because they quote the scriptures so profusely, and then you look up the context, you know, to any section of interest, and before you know it, you're you're reading uh, as much uh, or if not more scriptures than you are the early Christian writings themselves. So that's that's how I go about doing it. Um, how about you, Travis? I, I, I tend to study. Um, yeah, I, I don't know that I go through it cover to cover um, every year. I think that I probably read the majority of the standard works every year um, just through studies. But like I'll, I'll pick up an Old Testament book that I haven't accessed and, and just read it, study it for a couple of weeks. Um, I, I did the same thing with the Book of Mormon. I'll sit down and I'll go through you know, Mosiah over and over again for a couple of weeks. And so I tend to find that that's been a little bit more profitable for me, but no, I think that what Robert's suggesting is having a structure to the study, I think is significant to help you understand that how, how important it is. But also one of the things that's commonly asked, especially from missionaries is, you know, what books can I read? Um, and I'm thinking you haven't read the standard works. Like you, you've never read the Doctrine and Covenants. You've never read the Pearl of Great Prize. And, 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 and like Robert says, I don't think that we have to have certainly not the knowledge that Robert has. I mean, studying this stuff is for, for, for you is a profession. It's what you do for a living. And so I don't think that that is necessary. But what is, is a command of what's going on. I don't think that you need to have the ability to say, oh, I know every chapter and I know every verse and somebody quotes something to you and you can instantly uh, kick off the, the, the citation for it. I, I don't think that's, that's necessary, but certainly you should have a very good understanding of what's going on in Alma, you know, chapter by chapter or even chunks of chapters. So if somebody says, you know, Alma in the 30s. What's going on in the in the 30s chapters? What's going on in the 40s chapters? Do you understand the the narrative structure? Do you are you are you interacting with you know even even on a, a on a, a level of what is going on in the government? What's going on politically in the Book of Mormon? Where are the spiritual strengths of the Book of Mormon insofar as where are the sermons being taught? What's the topics of those sermons? Where can they be found? You, you need to know that stuff. I don't think you need to be able to rattle off or have to be able to rattle off, oh, it's, you know, Alma 36 is this and Alma 42 is that. That's not necessary. But what is necessary is certainly to be able to say, ah, that's probably in the 30s or 31 or so. I know what that's about. That's about this. And you better have a pretty good command of that material. Yeah, in that and, way at least. Uh, when it comes to say like secondary scholarship or secondary literature, like um, so like say biblical commentaries and scholarship or Book of Mormon commentaries and articles, 
that's yeah, that's important if you go like you like dig deep. Mm -hmm. But frankly, it's meaningless if you don't know the primary sources. You know, like the scriptures themselves very well. You know, you could read right. like say ten or hundred books on say uh, Paul's theology of salvation or the Book of Mormon and its Mesoamerican -American context, and that could be all fine. But on the scriptures, you don't. But if you don't know the text itself or the relevant text themselves, um, it's not going to like uh, be as productive as if you know the scriptures very well. Uh, and then you can actually have a better appreciation of the and critical engagement with the other sources as well. But I think that I think that that's a good point, too, because I think that a lot of people who end up leaving the church who actually, you know, and, and again, Bart Ehrman tends to be a staple for a lot of people who are who, who fall into that. They usually read him because he's agnostic or atheist, whatever he is now. But people who engage with with scholarship like that from people who are non-faithful, which I, I tend to do quite a bit, but. In, from that perspective, if you don't know Paul's letters because you've never read them thoroughly and you've never read them clearly, it's really easy to just take everything that somebody says that has a PhD and just say, well, that's what they said. They have a PhD. They know more than I do, right? And just accept their conclusions whole cloth. And then you talk to somebody like Robert who's like, yeah, that doesn't really make sense. And yeah, they're forgetting to do that, and they didn't really look at that aspect of it. And, and I think that that's, that's important to recognize, that if you don't have a command of the text, it's really easy to get deceived or go down rabbit holes that'll lead you to really bad places. Any, any final comments from yourself, Errol? Yeah, recognizing appeal to authority as logical fallacy is, is very important. Um, it being not latching on to like a specific favorite scholar uh, with pet theories and looking at the larger, you know, scholarly consensus. If there is a consensus on the issue, uh, it's important. The only thing there's a consensus on is climate change. Come on, man. We all know that. <laughs> okay, uh, let's kind of go back to the article. Um, number three uh, read LDS scholarship and apologetics. Of course, like once you have like a very good foundation and you continue having the uh, growth in scripture study, of course, uh, rather obvious, but has to be said, uh, make sure one reads the best the LDS side have to offer and ensure one does not needlessly reinvent the wheel. Uh, many arguments have been answered so thoroughly that simply linking to a general article and top topic will suffice, e.g. the a due argument from Jacob 7.27 or Revelation 22.18 and 19 as a proof text against post-biblical revelation, etc. Uh, being familiar with the previous work of the, say, the Neil A. Maxwell Institute in the time of Daniel Peterson, as well as other places like Book of Mormon Central, Fair Mormon, The Interpreter Foundation, the works of Blake Oster and others, and I would also include, uh, since I uh, wrote this article a few years ago, a, a group in holiday called the B.H. Roberts Foundation, uh, mormonora.org. Um, I'm a biased, but you know, um, I I think they're good. Uh, okay, so um, so basically TLDR is like, make sure you read, like say, good LDS scholarship and apologetics. And a lot of it's like free online. Like I said, the interpreter makes their stuff, uh, the journal articles anyway, free. And Book of Mormon Central is like a very good uh, library and stuff like that. Um, and also don't needlessly reinvent a wheel. It's like, if you come across new information that's going to add to the discussion, that's awesome. I've done it before. Um, but I think it's safe to say, like, at least when it comes to see certain criticisms have been so totally refuted, you know, um, like the Adu argument, the Lander Jerusalem argument, and other arguments. It's like, just some people linking to, like, a decent general article from Fair or Jeff Lindsay should do the trick, you know. Um, so, any comments from you guys, like, recommend the recommended LDS sources or, like, um, other tips on this particular topic? You mentioned most of the uh, in the highlights right there. Yeah, I, th I think that that that's. I, I think it's really important to understand that. I think that one of the things that helped me to kind of get into at least reading a lot of the fair articles um, years and years ago when it first started was how much antagonism there was against them, and I thought I felt that like why are they so angry? about these articles because i would read them and i'm like these are actually really well written they seem to be very well researched and so i thought well there's so much animosity towards these guys they must be full of crap so i started digging into the sources i'm like what so anyway that to me bolstered their legitimacy because of how much antagonism there was against those and again helps you identify 
your your anti Mormons because they're the ones that are like, oh, you can't read fair. Okay, but you, you should probably, you know, take an article that's been written by them and respond to it if you think it's such crap. But they never do. And usually the response is like, "Bro, have you read the CES letter?" Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jeremy Runnels is you know the great biblical scholar. <laughs> Okay. Um, do you want to add anything, Errol, yourself? Or? Well, no, no, I think you guys uh, got that one covered pretty good. Mm. Cool beans. Okay, uh, number four, uh, read non-LDS scholarship. Um, now, one will get a lot of insights and positive intellectual challenges when reading non-LDS scholarship on various issues, like, um, for instance, uh, my study of, say, Catholic theology and apologetics um, on the Eucharist, that actually result in like me writing like a number of articles on the priesthood because Catholic apologists are pointing out Christ is using priestly sacrificial language in the institution of the Lord's Supper, which would, have, would kind of indicate like a new type, new copy of priesthood, you know. So, um, you know, as well as works in the theology of the Eucharist, to just give one example of many. So like, um, yes, do read LDS scholarship, but also read non-LDS scholarship. Now, sometimes they will have a different worldview, different theological perspective. You have to keep that in mind. But at the same time, like, you know, even if you say, like, you know, Ehrman has been mentioned, like, um, Ehrman's worldview is wacky and some of his conclusions are wrong. But, like, at the same time, someone who has, like, an Ehrman PhD studied under Metzger, who's, like, one of the best conservative uh, evangelical scholars on the New Testament of all time, and also knows Greek very well. Like, um, he's translation of the Apostolic Fathers. He's awesome. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he, if he's been doing this, like, academically and professionally for, like, a couple of decades, I think it would be naive and silly to think, well, you know, he's an agnostic, you know, he's a critic of Christianity, he has nothing good to say, um, that, which is baloney, you know, uh, or like when it comes to say like a Catholic scholar, like a Brand Petrie or Scott Hahn, yeah, you know, um, they do have like a problematic theology confessionally, but at the same time, like say Hahn's book, Kinship of Covenant, is an excellent book of covenantal theology in the Bible, you know, uh, I think like, the LDS should be uh, cognizant of that book, you know, so um, don't throw the baby out with the batter water when it comes to see non-LDS scholarship. Yes, they might say something's questionable. Sometimes it might be informed by you know their uh, differences of say um, epistemology or worldview or theology. But at the same time, um, you know if you kind of if you kind of consider like the best LDS apologists of all time, like say B. H. Roberts or U. Nibley or the Pratt brothers, you know they read loads of non-LDS works. Um, and they benefited from them. They actually could extrapolate, say, the uh, good from the bad, you know, and um, use that to, like, bolster the intellectual uh, firepower, if you will, of LDS apologetics and true claims and so forth. So, yeah. I, 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 because I've, I've come across, like, some LDS if they see a knee jerk reaction, like, oh, you know, that he's a Catholic, or he, mm -hmm. oh, they're just not members of the church. They don't have anything of value to say on the topic. And instead, that's, apart from being very anti intellectual, that's just simply wrong. Yeah, but I, I find that a lot of the uh, um, non-LDS, if they're actually, that's how, that's, how, that's how I can gauge scholarship is that if somebody is able to make an argument that just says, look, this is this is the position that's been extrapolated. Other scholars have come to the same conclusions. And if you're paying attention, the argument actually supports LDS theological conclusions. That to me, because, or it opens the door for them. That to me is showing that, look, even though this might hurt my own theology, I'm still able to present that specific issue. So um, examples can include, um, well, a denial of, of the fact that the Bible teaches a creatio ex nihilo. A scholar will say, well, you know, that that doctrine is just not taught in the biblical text. It's a, and even though they're, they're even though they're staunch evangelicals, you know, like I, I believe that doctrine, but the texts don't support it, for example. And so... Um, learning that stuff helps you to understand that even though Joseph Smith was not a biblical scholar, his his theology, the robustness of his theology developed and biblical scholarship does support it. But you've got to read non-Latter-day Saint sources in order to develop that kind of a perspective. Yep. Uh, anything you want to say, Earl? Like, um, I know you've done a lot of work on, say, patristics. So, like, uh, what's been the benefits of reading, like, say, non-LDS? Um, and there's not that much LDS in it, but, like, non-LDS scholarship on the patristics or the early Christians, I should say. I mean, has, yeah, has that I mean, been useful, uh, beneficial? Yeah. Uh, and I get 
that reaction from some Latter-day Saints to the early Christian writings? Like, oh, well, these guys living in a time of apostasy or, or whatnot. But I I've also had to remind me the uh, article of faith following the admonition of Paul here. If there's anything virtuous, lovely, or a good report or praiseworthy, we seek after these things. There's no connotation there that those things are only found within the church. Church well, and, and and it's dismissive to think that the church fathers, you know, were were evil or had some kind of, because they weren't. I mean, these these are the men who put themselves out there to try to support and to proliferate the the Christian faith and spread the message of Jesus. I mean, yeah, they they had some. They went they went awry a couple of times, but they did so from a position of faithfulness and. Um, that doesn't mean that their scholarship's crap. Most of what they produced, the majority of what they produce is actually good. Especially good on baptism. Yeah, especially on baptism. <laughs> so, but yeah, they're, 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 it's, and then knowing that, I mean, I think about how faith affirming that is to find out that, well, the, the discussion that Errol and I had a few months ago about the Trinity and the development of the trinity learning that and learning the actual um, meaning of what they were talking about in those writings how you can understand that the trinity the way they use the terms the way that they understood those doctrines is inconsistent from the way that modern christianity understands them and actually more accurately reflects our own understanding of god and if you don't if you don't interact with that material then you're missing a lot Okay, uh, number five, uh, read the best the other side has to offer. Um, yes, one will have to read anti-Mormon literature, but one should also be well-read in the best works from the other perspective. For example, many of our critics are Calvinists, so one should read the works both historical, such as those of Calvin, Turretin, Charles Hodge, as well as their modern apologists, such as R.C. Sproul, as well as confessions, such as, say, the Westminster Confession. Uh, is it, it is essential that one not only knows what one's theological opponent believes, but why the theological, biblical, historical reasoning behind such doctrines. Uh, because, like, put yourself in, uh, imagine, like, if the it, it was uh, the roles were reversed, you know, you would expect the other person to actually have minimally read, like, say, some Latter-day Saint works, be familiar with, like, say, some Latter-day Saint authors, like in Blake Oster or James Talmadge or whoever, you know, uh, and kind of know not just what you believe, but why you believe, like, say, you know, uh, how it's tied into other doctrines, the historical reasoning, the biblical reasoning, the logical reasoning from your perspective as to, like, why you believe X, Y, and Z, you know, and as I said, like, yeah, you have to read anti-Mormon literature, but at the same time, you know, it's not just, like, say, uh, the Ansons or the Bowmans or the Tanners, you know, the world, you know, um, you know, you should actually read, like, say, respectful uh, theologians, historical, modern, from like say yeah. Arminius or Calvin, or you know, if they're a Catholic, like a Newman or the Council of Trent or what have you, you know, uh, you should know the best the other side has to offer, confessionally and apologetically, if you will, so you can actually meaningfully interact with it. Because like we expect our critics to show intellectual honesty and integrity, and we're peed off whenever, and because that rarely happens many of the times. We, at the very least, like we should actually display that intellectual integrity we expect our critics to display as well, you know. Yes. No, and I, I get, I get, uh, I think that also too, it what it allows you to do is as you talk to somebody. So if you're if you've read Calvinism, what you won't do is you won't do what a lot of people think is apologetics, and that's to create caricatures or strawman, you'll, you'll actually gain some respect from whomever you're talking with if they see, look, this guy has an objectivity to him. He has an ability to actually dig deep and accurately represent doctrines like the Trinity. He understands sola fide. He understands sola scriptura. It's not just a, uh, oh, you guys believe in, you know, three and one and you know an egg or, or you know or also you, and, you can do whatever you want you can you yeah can murder if you want you can kill people and god still loves you yeah so yeah and so calvin, you, you, well to be fair calvin probably said that after Savitas, but you know that's an exception <laughs> 
So, and it's it's hard it's hard to 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 avoid making ridiculous caricatures of somebody else's perspective if you haven't read. What about you, Earl? Any comments you want to make? It's generally, it doesn't always work against Calvinists though, because Calvinists thrive on being misunderstood. So even <laughs> being to survive their theology to them, but no, 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 no. That that that's not how it works. Actually, that's not how compatibilism. Is. So you're like, so, well, how, how does it work? Well, it kind of. Well, you'll never way, understand but... until you have the noose. I'm sorry, that's the Eastern Orthodox. You'll never understand until like you're no longer totally depraved, and although we still have no other effects of self. But yeah, that's true. Like, uh, you know, but many Calvinists will say, like, unless you're here a Calvinist and you're a believing Calvinist, you'll never understand Calvinism. That's yeah, basically you can't. You that's can't the, the Bible. That the you Bible. You quote from the Westminster to... Confession. You quote, quote, quote from Charity. You quote from Charles Hodge. But you're not understanding it. <laughs> You know, basically, it's Gnosticism. You know, uh, you know the secret knowledge or the the in uh, the inner uh, members. You know, would actually know. You know, or or my favorite is the conclusion that you've come to is correct. The way you've represented is correct, but it still sounds terrible. And you're like, okay, that's what we believe. Still sounds like crap, but it's because you're not regenerate. <laughs> if if you were if you were saved. It would make sense to you. Yeah, if you were oh, saved, okay. you would know when Peter says baptism now saves you. Yeah. He does not mean baptism now saves you. Or when yeah. Paul in Romans speaks about baptism being the means by which we're united to Christ and the salvific death, you know, if you had manus or whatever, you know, you would understand that's not about water baptism at all. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, joking aside. And, you know, I'm affirming the Calvinism is a false gospel and he's even satanical camp. Um, you know, you still have to, like, uh, read the best they have to offer. You know? And to be fair, like, no, you need to produce anyone as good as Charles Hodge or Francis Turton. You know, you compare them with, say, James White or Durbin or Constantine or whatever. It's not even close, you know. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, the next point is... Uh, know how to spot historical and logical fallacies. Uh, this will allow you to, one, ensure you don't engage in them, and two, you can point them out in your opponent's arguments. Uh, some good works on this would include Hackett Fisher's Historian's Fallacies, Kreef's Socratic Logic, Bo Binet, Logically Fallacious, McCurney's Being Logical, A Guide to Good Thinking. So, um, you know, no, no logical fallacies, at least the basic ones, like non secretary straw men, red herring, appeal to authority. Um, and, but also be familiar with what's called a fallacy fallacy. Just because someone argues for something fallaciously does not mean that their conclusion is wrong, just like how they're getting there is wrong. For instance, I could claim, Joseph Smith was a prophet of God because I like ice cream. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that's a fallacy. For, you know, that's a fallacy, but to claim like Joseph Smith can't be a prophet because I use a really stupid argument, that's a fallacy fallacy as well. So be familiar with that one as well uh, in your repertoire. Well, well, and I find that I find that again for purposes of interaction. So I, I tell the missionaries all the time. They're like, you know, we're trying to talk to this person. They don't believe me. They don't trust me. Whatever. And I said that's because you are not in a position of authority for them. And I like, well, what does he mean? Well, until they respect what you're saying and they trust you, they're never going to listen to anything you say. So one of the things that I found on my mission, as I learned more about the doctrines of other faiths. I could actually help them to kind of explain what their church taught correctly. And they said, oh, well, he's not dishonest. He actually understands what our doctrine is. Maybe I wasn't very articulate, but he understood it. Oh, okay. So then I could contrast it. But that only works if you can actually get an agreement from them that what you're presenting is actually their theology. And if that doesn't work, what I often tell the missionaries to do, which some missionaries don't, some missions don't allow them to do that, go to church with them meet with their pastor afterwards, have their pastor explain what their theology is so you can contrast it then afterwards, right? And I found that that was helpful. But again, if you're if you're misrepresenting and you're, you're engaging in a logically fallacious argument, then you're never going to develop any kind of authority in their life where they'll actually listen to you. And so, and that, which is the, which is the point. I mean, the point of doing apologetics is to not just support the, the and uh, defend the truth claims of the church, but also to actually effectuate a change in somebody's life to accept those things. And if you've never engaged on that level and everything you say is sarcastic or cynical, like, uh, like Constantino says, <laughs> where he keeps saying that we don't understand him and, 
and uh, he keeps admitting that we're right. And I, I guess he doesn't realize sarcasm doesn't translate on a written context, so whatever. Uh, Errol, you're into like uh, no logical fallacies. I kind of seen the uh, chart you have in your home to teach your kids or like any comments about like um, good resources or anything. Like oh, I want to see the chart. Uh, let me show you that real quick. I want to see a chart. <clears throat> so anytime my children use a logical fallacy, it's time to go to the hall. Oh, that's fantastic. I love you, Dad. So we've got this is the main one over here. So you can see this one. Uh, thou shalt not commit logical fallacies. This should this should actually replace art in Latter day Saint chapels. And it goes over quite a few uh fallacies on the board Gosh, that's here. almost all of them well, you'd be surprised just how many fallacies there are i mean there's more and then there's a whole separate one uh for uh, thou shalt not suffer biases and that's that's fantastic you'll have to message me where you got those uh, so the link it gives down here is www.yourbias uh, dot is. Um, Dude, I'm putting that. It's actually presented in a way that they have a web page where you can send people links for specific uh, fallacies and biases um, as they use them against you. <laughs> just, just to get it. And it gives examples. And it really helps to be able to think through these things. It's important so that not only so you can identify other things, um, but also so that you can realize when you yourself uh, are using them. But they also have um, all of that in flashcard form. Um, I think I have those in the car right now. Um, flashcards are good. But um, yeah, yeah, uh, critical thinking. Uh, and actually, scroll publishing. Um, David Brousseau came up with the critically thinking Christian because he felt that that was necessary. It, it's good for Latter Day Saints too. And now, um, through Sattler College, he actually has a whole course um, on that, where he really is breaking it down. But that that's going the extra mile, right there. Yeah, that's good. But you know, basically, no like logical fallacies. Also, the Fisher book I mentioned, Historians' Fallacies, that's very good. Like um, explaining this uh, fallacies and like works on history as well. Um, you know. Uh, I know Stephen Harper has applied that book to Fawn Brody's No Man Knows My History when it comes to the first vision, and it's pretty good. Uh, but definitely be familiar with that work as well. Um, so, okay, uh, number seven, uh, engage in apologetics for the right reasons. Uh, we are all called to defend the faith as well as provide the strong reasons for belief therein, and that is what apologetics only is. It is not to show off one's knowledge, it is not to embarrass others, etc. Now, I will readily admit that when I was younger, I did have a more acidic attitude, and some will say I still do, and would engage with people just to show them up. Uh, fortunately, I've repented of such an attitude albeit imperfectly. Uh, if one is wishing to enter the realm of LDS apologetics, just to vent, show off, or simply to embarrass people, such is not proper as it goes against 1 Peter 3, 16, where one is called to glorify Christ in your apologetic. At the same time, one has to be forceful at times, as truth and eternity itself is at stake. So, you know, uh, make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. You know, you could be very well-read, you could be very studious when you get to scriptures, you could have a rock-solid testimony, but at the same time, like, if you're not doing it for the right reasons, i.e. to glorify Christ, to defend gospel, and to actually lead people not necessarily your opponents, because sometimes your opponents will just be the most heard hurt people of all time and they need a road of Damascus type experience. But onlookers, you know, who are intellectually honest and are seeking, you know, um, God can actually use apologetics as an instrument that means you either build up faith, certain faith, save faith, or even bring people to faith. So uh, any any comments you guys want to make? I've been guilty of such things in the past. Um... I, th I think most of us have at one point or another. Um, but yeah, you got to make the conscious effort. To try not to get drawn into that. Well, and, and, and also be aware of the fact that most people, if you are showing them up, meaning that they've not entered into a 
discussion with any degree of preparation, um, or maybe they were cocky or haughty when they did so. If you are demonstrating you have a better command of the material, they may resort to an emotional response to your caustic attitude in an attempt to save face. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you're doing poorly, but you do need to watch it. I mean, we, I think like you guys said, we all, it, it's, it's fun, can be entertaining to, as the missionaries say, wreck somebody, but it is not the purpose for which we're doing this. Yeah, no, sometimes it is call for it to wreck someone, depending on the context. Like, um, if someone comes on and claims, like, you know, you're all a bunch of idiots, I'm this scholar, you know, I've studied this topic, and you have a piss poor grasp, I think it's right to actually embarrass them and to destroy them in that context. Uh, depending, you know, at, at times, it kind of depends, you know, and you have to intuit, but, but all things be equal, you shouldn't, you know. Um, yeah. you know. Well, so I have a, I have a, a meme that I keep that's, Rob Bowman came into a group with, um, I'm I'm the god of scholarship. If anybody dares engage with me, be warned. And then yeah, he has a PhD and he has to receive the Yeah. And then three days later, it's like I'm out of here. You guys are acting like children. Bye. <laughs> because so many people decimated all of his arguments. So, so yeah. Sometimes it needs to happen if somebody's going to come in with a chip on their shoulder. But yeah, that's not ultimately the purpose. To be fair, not all critics are scumbags like Robert Bowman. So, yeah. but there's a lot in the delivery there. The way that you dismantle them, it's like because I've I run into a lot of people who pretend to know a lot about early Christianity when they're faced with it, um, and a lot of the time it's kind of necessary to say like, okay, look, here's a list of things that you just got wrong, factual errors. It's like the more you talk about early Christianity, the more demonstrably wrong things you say so, so you, we can't just take your word you know on any of this because yeah yeah that that does happen but you can't just it has to do with your tact it has to do with your delivery you don't want to go all pro dramatic rustling on them or anything like that um, oh what is that like, yeah. like kind of expensive. Robert's about to play my favorite YouTube video ever. <laughs> Actually, like one expensive thing. Mr. Madison, what you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I've ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. Okay, a simple wrong would have done just fine, but then you remain one. I think you're muted, Errol, but yeah. Um, sometimes you want to say that, but like you have to like intuit like as to when it's uh, proper to say it. You know? <laughs> yeah. Or add it to the end of somebody's response. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Uh, number eight is uh, read, read, read. Um, the most effective apologists are bibliophiles. files. So, like, if you look at a Unibly or Stephen Smith or Dan Pearson, Lee Bill Hamblin, Jeffrey Bradshaw, who's freaking hell genius, um, or like the Prap Redders and so forth, like they were very well read. You know, um, one must enjoy reading and studying. Now, that doesn't mean one must have a personal reading library of seven or ten uh, thousand volumes. I was going to say you need to update the article. Yeah, yeah, that. yeah, yeah. But one must read on a daily basis, even if it's just quote unquote a few pages of a book or a journal article, etc. If one does not have um, as much time as they wish to, they may have to make some personal sacrifices, like say give up two or three hours of TV or Netflix a week to dedicate time to reading both the scriptures as well as other works. So, um, you know. Again, if you think of, like, say, the best apologists the church has produced, or like any other tradition has produced, you know, um, what do they have all in common? They're very well read. You're mm -hmm. not going to come across a very good apologist who has never read a book in his life or has never read a journal article in his life. It's, it, it's as simple as that. Now, I'm saying, like, you know, you know, you must read and, like, uh, you know, uh, but but if you're engaged in apologetics, you must be a reader. You know, even if it's only quote unquote maybe a few pages a day or a journal or you have to make sacrifices, you know, you know, um, you, you may have to like say, until say watching, like say you're, say the reruns of Star Trek the next generation, like I said, as a Trekkie, 
you might like um instead of like maybe binge like 10 episodes like on the holiday but like instead of doing it every day like read a book read an article read a chapter read something online you know listen to a very good podcast even if you have to uh commute you know but if you make that study like after say a year after three years <laughs> after five years you'll actually accumulate a lot of stuff mm-hmm. you know um so be well read i mean and, and you know there's i mean audio books are available i again I really so I was I was telling some missionaries. There's a couple of of uh, LDS uh, resources online that produce videos. Um, videos are great. Um, it's good to watch somebody kind of break things down, but it's just not a substitute for reading. Yeah, I mean, a six minute video doesn't teach you everything you need to know about early church history. A six minute video is not going to tell you everything you need to know about polygamy. I mean, it's just it's just not going to do it. And so listening to books on audible or something like that that's great that can certainly help things to sink into your brain but you better actually read the hard copy um, pull it up on kindle um, if you don't want to have the the truckload of books behind you that robert does i'm sure not all of those are available on kindle though right yeah and also this kind of raises like make sure you know the primary historical sources very well like when it comes to see joseph smith's polygamy um make sure you bookmark uh, joseph smith's polygamy uh dot com or dot org brian hales's website where he has like scans of all the sources he used for his three volumes or there's just smith papers and the church history <laughs> library well, um uh, make sure you know the primary source and not just the secondary literature on a given topic as well you know, right and, and i found you know that was one of the first things i did when i got into this is that um reading the scriptures and of course and then i started reading the journal of discourses i read uh the early church history because i found that that was what antagonists were mostly citing to and yeah, so there yeah, you've got to you've got to interact with that. Do you have to read all of it? Eh, probably not, but you should probably read a chunk. You should probably have a good understanding of. Uh, well, one of the things I tell the missionaries is it's what's great about reading, even even though Brigham Young didn't write the Journal of Discourses, of course, by reading through enough of his material, you actually get a feel for his personality and his character. So when somebody does throw out a quote or something that you're that you haven't heard before, you can actually put it immediately into the context of Brigham Young as a person. And so that's what the great thing is about reading the primary sources is, is you actually get to know the person that's being discussed. You get to understand what was origin actually like, at least in so far as we can understand it by reading the patristics. Um, you read Joseph Smith's papers and you read the documents that he was involved in, his letters to Emma. You start to get a feel for what he was as a person, not just a, a you know, the, and then the claims that he was a unscrupulous money digger just become easy to respond to. Earl, you want to say something? I was very busy. Yeah. Okay. I've added like one or two others. Uh, one is rather obvious, but because um, a lot of apologetics these days is like internet apologetics in some t- uh, shape or form. Um, Captain Obvious, but know how to type well. <laughs> you know, uh, if you're if you're like me when I was like 17, 18, just using like fingers like this for like uh, university essays, it's going to take well. It's like at least know how to type like maybe 30 words a minute or something like that because, again, you're going to be behind a keyboard. That's where like most of the apologetics and most of the responses will be produced. Um, like say a Facebook discussion or a blog or whatever. So know how to type. So like Mavis Beacon, whatever her name is, like she actually has some good programs or like, uh, you know, just learn how to do uh, touch type and maybe like minimally 30 words a minute. Like I know how to do like 80 or 90 um, just because I've been doing it for years, but know how to type like maybe 30 words a minute. You know, and it's a skill like you can actually transpose because like every workplace now expects you to know minimally like maybe 30 words or something like that a minute on a computer. Um, so... I know it's kind of obvious, but make sure you know how to type because you're not going to be doing, you're not going to do a good job if you only don't know how to use like one or two fingers for each hand. You know, I, I you know, so. Uh, but also, there's... also too, also too with that, I was going to say a warning with that. Remember, when somebody posts something on whatever, whatever social media site you're on, you do not have to respond immediately. You can soak on it. You can think about it. You can craft a coherent intelligent response not just a knee-jerk you know dumb thing also you can actually make sure that you've spelled words correctly 
used commas appropriately. Um, we all we all screw up. You know, sometimes typing with my thumbs, I'll miss a word or something. But you know, one or two in a long comment's fine. But if every word is misspelled and there's no punctuation and and you responded 10 seconds after they did, you probably shouldn't be doing that. Yeah, sure. No, that's good. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to bring up was, of course, like the role of patristics. So like, um, Errol, mm -hmm. if you want to like, maybe like make a recommendation to say, what well, very good introductory volumes on the patristics. Um, there's one by Pinwin that I know that you've recommended before. It's like, um, no. Because, like, I would say, like, at the very least, like, um, if you're serious about apologetics, you should at least read the entirety of the Apostolic Fathers um, a few times over. So, uh, Eric, if you want to, like, uh, maybe make... Penguin Classics uh, published this one. Um, early Christian Writings. Now, this is translated by Maxwell Standerforth with a uh, commentary from Andrew Loth. Loth is a huge name in patristics. Um, this has most of all of the earliest post-biblical Christian writings. And another thing that I've reminded Latter-day Saints of uh, on occasion is, you know, given our truth claims, technically a lot of these guys are actually our bishops, you know, valid ordinations and all. So this this is uh, probably the best place uh, to start as far as, you know, primary uh, sources on the early Christian writings go. And if you're looking for a secondary source, it's an introduction to patristics. Um, I think I gave the, that volume away recently. Um, David W. Rousseau's uh, Will the Real Heretics Please Stand Up uh, is a great intro. I might have. And also, Berceau has the book, uh, A Dictionary of Early Christian Beliefs, uh, a reference guide to more than 700 topics discussed by the early church fathers. So that not, one is it's not, it's not a replacement for like reading the Apostolic Fathers, but like it's a very good. Um, it will save you a lot of legwork, like if you want to see like what they said about baptism or icons or the Assumption of Mary. Um, yeah, you'll definitely find. In fact, like I'll do a solid here. Here's all the references to icon veneration and the Assumption of Mary in the Antinocene Fathers. There you go, people. Now, uh, <laughs> but it's still it's much better than say the Index to the uh, Shaft series. Yeah, it's got over. 700 topics that it discusses in there, but it is designed to be a supplemental work to the Anthonocene Fathers, 10 volumes that those guys up there. Um, the references in it, um, it will just give you a reference to the volume and page number, and you, you kind of want to have access to the Anthonocene Fathers if you're using because that's where your references for contents uh, are going to have to come from. So do note that, uh, but the best intro stuff, that's, that's like a little on the next step side. Um, Real Heretics from David Brousseau and uh, Early Christian Writings from Staniforth are probably the two basic uh, entry-level sources that I would recommend. And for like a Latter-day Saint engagement, like of course there's Barry Bickmore's book, Restoring the Ancient Church, uh, the book um, oh, yes. The Mormons Have a Leg to Stand On. Uh, I think Peterson is the author of that book. Um, and also, I know the Maxwell Institute is bringing out a book on the early Christians, and I'm hoping it's going to be good um, at the end of this month. So it seems it seems like it will be good. Uh, so there's like some LDS engagement with the patristics beyond the uh, patristics bad, or just simply quote mining the patristics to prove that they were proto Mormons in all respects. They weren't, but um, yeah, like at, at the very least, like uh, Latter Day Saints should read like uh, one Clement, Justin Martyr, the Authentic Nation Letters, the Didache. And uh, some of the earlier, early stuff, like basically, uh, and maybe graduate at the very least when it comes to say all five volumes of Against Heresies by Irenaeus. Um, but at the very least, like read those and maybe like, um, maybe like uh, be familiar with say the creeds, like their decrees and their um, acta and stuff like that. Richard Price, who's a Catholic scholar and priest in Liver uh, in the Liverpool area, he's he's been doing like uh, translations of the acta of like uh, the ecumenical councils that are available, like Second I.C. and Chalcedon. So um, yeah. But that's a bit more hardcore as well. So, yeah, even Irenaeus against heresies can be uh, kind of hardcore because his detailed descriptions of Gnostic beliefs—it's almost like you're experiencing it. It's not going to sit well with some people. So that's, that, I'd consider that heavier stuff too. But yeah, uh, just. So, 
No, that's perfect. Like, uh, we just kind of went through the artic uh, article, so, like, um, any final comments you guys want to add, like, maybe other suggestions or recommendations, like, how to be an effective LDS apologist, um, before we wrap things up? No, I, I, the only thing I would, I would add just as a, as a way of encouragement that, there's a lot. I mean, there, the the volumes that are sitting behind Errol are, are can be overwhelming, but um, just start picking through them. I mean, uh, the church, the church fathers, the patristic writings are are overwhelming. I, I've personally not read all of them, but it's it's a lot. And but you'll find that as you start to digest them, it it goes pretty quickly. Um, they're not as out out there. Or they're not as difficult to to access as some people think they are. Some people heard we hear the word patristic writings or anti nacian fathers and they get all overwhelmed and scared, but it's not. Yeah, and also they're available of. online, like say ccl.org, New Advent. Um, no, yeah, so, and there's also like modern translations, like say the Catholic University Press, the founders of the church series and stuff like that. They offered fresh translations. So um, yeah, but at the same time, like at the Shaft series, so, uh, you know, if you want to be like very hardcore, it's kind of indispensable. Um, Unless, of course, you want to learn, say, Latin and Greek and um, Patristic Latin and Greek, you know, and kind of go through all few hundred volumes of the Vinya set or uh, something like that, which will be fun, but, like, um, ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> but, yeah. Come on. Okay, uh, so any other following comments before we wrap things up? Yeah. Okay, well, that's good. Um, I'll upload this to my YouTube channel, but, like, it may be useful for, like, say, the missionaries as well, like, um, you know, if they want to like engage in apologetics post mission. Oh I, I I wanted to add one more one Go more ahead. point. Um and, and maybe maybe put something like this in your in your article is um from my from my professional perspective it's oftentimes allowing somebody to lay out their the foundation of their position themselves without helping them. If it looks like they're challenging you, challenging your beliefs, let them do that. Because one of the things that's a common mistake you can make is thinking that you've learned a lot, thinking that you know a lot, or thinking you know more than the person you're talking to, and then you start assuming a burden of proof. And burdens of proof allocations, I don't know if you guys have already talked about this, but the burdens of proof allocations are incredibly important when you're engaged in any kind of a discussion where people disagree. Don't start making the claims that you thereafter have to prove. Because by doing that, you put more burden on yourself than is actually necessary. If they're the ones making claims, let them prove them, let them support them, and then be ready and prepared for responding to them. It's a lot easier to do it that way than it is to start to make affirmative claims that you thereafter have to prove. Yeah, like a uh, an example would be like, say, if you're engaging with a Protestant and they say, like, well, you know, special revelation ceased with the death of the last apostle, the Bible is formally sufficient, blah, blah, blah. It's like... They have the burden to prove that, you know. Um, you don't have to prove that they squash, you know, they're making don't, assumption. Yeah, don't thereafter say, no, the Book of Mormon's the word of God. Okay, now you've just made the affirmative claim. And what will happen is, is because of the missionary kind of mindset that sometimes people have, we are used to teaching our doctrine and our theology and our history. We are used to that. It's it's something that's taught to us in our church. And so as a, as a missionary-minded religion, um, and so we're often easily goaded into that kind of a perspective pretty quickly. And so, whereas somebody might say, you know, the Bible only teaches a certain Jesus or a certain perspective on God. Okay, well, have them walk you through it. Um, Sola Scriptura is the, the principal doctrine in the Bible. Okay, walk me through it. Show me where it is. And so from that, it allows you time to craft better responses to craft better uh, better understanding so that you can tailor what you're saying based on the knowledge that you've obtained hopefully from your own study to be able to respond more effectively yeah that's good so um errol any final comments you want to add uh just that um you know, the christian writings are kind of an affirmation of the central truth claim of the restored church which is it is a restoration uh, of uh, these early Christian principles, the original understanding of the Bible as the apostles handed down. So that's why it was kind of at the crux of my conversion. Um, someday I'll publish a book. You should. 
I look forward to reading that. Try to get it done uh, before the second coming. All right. <laughs> hey, they were also like many of them were like historical premillennialists. So like at least you're keeping with that attitude as well. So. <laughs> Like Justin, uh, but yeah, uh, that, that's good. Like, uh, so um, I'll end the stream here. But like, uh, thanks guys cool. for coming on. And um, you know, uh, this was done to celebrate me hitting like 500 subscribers on YouTube. So here's to like a the remaining 496 are gonna get monetized. So uh, yay! <laughs> but uh, yeah, hopefully okay. this will be a good resource for those who like want to like engage in apologetics and like know, you know, some of the very important uh, tips you know you should know before you engage in it. Yeah, but. Thanks again, guys, and um, hopefully this will be a good resource for everyone who listens to it.